We're good on Miles' side, good on Rich's. I think. Cool, that's the thumbs up. That means that this is nothing explained. Today, I will definitely not be explaining Burning Man. Mm -mm. Uh, well, joining me as always, Ryan Fu. Ryan Fu and I both had uh, guests lined up for today and had no plans to talk about Burning Man, but when the guests canceled, being that we just got back from Burning Man, we thought, hey, let's talk about Burning Man. Actually, Ryan was like, I'm just going to talk about Burning Man. I was like, so am I. No, that's exactly what happened. But that's okay because uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan will do, Ryan's kind of the non-linear the magic type in our relationship. We're the, the yin and yang. Hmm. So if you want to get kind of more of that perspective, go check out uh, Il Fuminati from today. I will hopefully get, you know, that linked below. God, have that I, would be cool, right? Have if, I done it yet? If we were to the point where we could, it's That's it's not, right here. It's not very hard. Well, God, I hope I did it. All right, let's get rid of it. <laughs> I'm totally gonna make it swipe the other direction. <laughs> if that's a thing you. What can a dick! Do. What a dick! So tell us, uh, what is the linear progression of Burning Man? How are you gonna first linearly tell us how you're linear, linearly going to tell us about Burning Man? Uh, well, I'll do it. You know the uh, the basics, like kind of where it started and what it's kind of turned into is what I'm thinking, and then uh, and but I'm just I'll just do the kind of like my version of the survival guide is what I was thinking because I run a camp for uh, last year I did 24 this year I did 12 I think I planned for 15 we ended up with like 12 people or whatever mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am, I think, fully uh, prepared to tell people how to prepare for Burning Man. So we'll go that <laughs> way. We'll throw in some like mental preparation as well. Um, you definitely want to bring a lot of love to the burn. Oh, I got, why? My, I got my burn glasses on. These were a special gift from a very special friend of mine. They but fit you well. They they did well for you in the burn. And uh, well, they yeah, look I don't good know, on your face. I don't know if you know this, but I have a couple of superpowers. One of them is that I look good in all pairs of sunglasses. I heard you say that. Mm -hmm. It even got tested <laughs> at the burn. Ryan didn't believe me, and I put on a pair of sunglasses, and he was really pissed. You could see the look on his face. He was, like, pissed that he couldn't – that that pair of sunglasses didn't negate it. Mm. There was, like, ten more pairs of sunglasses. He could have just been like, all right, try this on. Try this on. But as soon as the first ones, he was like, ah, you're right. He was like – you just have one of those faces. <laughs> he, was, he was a little mad about it, but... Anyway, uh, shout out to Squid who gave me these glasses. I love that girl forever. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so uh, Burning Man basically kind of started as a beach party in 86. And they did it a couple of years, and then they didn't get a permit. Or they got big enough that so they got mad for not having a permit. And at the same time, a bunch of Dadaists... What's a Dadaist? Uh, well, D Dadaism was kind of like an art and self-expression um, movement. Yeah, it was. I think believe it was in France. Um, and anyway, they wanted some sort of like kind of self-expression thing, and they started using the Black Rock Desert. And then when uh, Burning Man got kicked off the beach, they moved to the Black Rock Desert as well. And then let's see, like, what was the name of that? Um, there was the the kind of like art. Aspects of Burning Man came from the, what was called Desert Sight Works. And then um, there was a, another one called Zone Number 4. And then um, Lee Harvey and his friends. And there was a little bit of crossover between them. And they all kind of joined together to turn into what was actually Burning Man. And the first year was officially called Burning Man was 1996. I think they actually might have called it Burning Man before that. But they came together, created an organization, and, pet and copyrighted the name Burning Man in 96. Mm. In 97, they weren't actually on the Black Rock Desert. Uh, they moved it to a nearby place. And then in 98, they were back at the Black Rock Desert. They had a fence. And Burning Man basically is what it is today. Um, but a lot has happened since then. Uh, so Burning Man, I'm going to ditch these guys so I can see a little better. It's not as lovely in here anymore. <laughs> Let's see how Ryan does. Ryan will... Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that actually does an interesting things to any of your image, actually. Yeah? Yeah, I'm trying to think what... Uh... I'm going to take a selfie. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so anyway, uh, Burning Man is now a four-square-mile area in the shape of a pentagon enclosed by a bright orange plastic fence called mm -hmm. the trash fence, which is seven miles long. So it's a very big area, um, which is why everyone takes bikes. So take a bike to Burning Man. You have or, to have a bike. Yeah, and there are free bikes out there. Uh, it does make... I didn't see a single one. 
You said they're the green ones, right? Yeah, well, they're called yellow bikes, but they're green. I did not see a single bike. You, you didn't was, notice. Yeah. They were there. Okay. Uh, I did see a couple. I didn't notice them around, like, just in piles, but last year I also hung out with this kid, Wave, who, he that's his thing, is using the yellow bikes, which are green, and... He, if you try, like, the, the idea is they're supposed to be free bike. Like, it's like the the go cars, you know, the little smart cars that yeah. you can use with the app, right? Mm-hmm. It's not your car, so don't lock it, you know, and you can't lock those. They're designed like that, but Burning Man yellow bikes, which are green, uh, are not meant to be locked up. And so if he found a bike that was locked up, he would fuck with your shit. Oh, so nice. he would drag the whole pile of bikes that was locked together off to the middle of nowhere where you couldn't find it because in the middle there was a yellow bike, which is green. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so Burning Man has uh, 10 principles, which they kind of like use to organize the event. And the first one is radical inclusion, which means that like nobody gets turned away. There's no reason for, um, you know, not being included in that particular situation. Of course, like if you're a terrible person or something, you're probably going to have uh, a terrible time and things. But there's no like pre-sifting process to determine whether you can or you cannot come. There's no income level other than... Uh, your ability to afford it, which is kind of an expensive thing because you're going to the middle of nowhere and surviving in the desert, which is not something that's very easy to do. Without uh, resources. With nothing, yeah. yeah. But uh, everybody comes together as a group and makes that much more possible. So radical inclusion, nobody gets turned away. Uh, and, there, and there are low-income tickets. You can apply for low-income tickets. There's, and there's plenty of ways to volunteer if you want to, like, honestly, if you want to go on a super budget, just volunteer for the center camp. You'll have a place to camp. All you need is a tent for the most part. They might even, if you work enough, they'll feed you a couple meals a day. And it's Burning Man. You can wander around and get the food you need. But is it, did you notice the um, the kind of like the people who were like clearly not being well fed and they were like looking for food all of the time? Yeah, I like, brought several of them food. Yeah. Um, and when you hand them food, they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> well, we had so much food at our camp. It was oh like, God. God, give it away. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we didn't do a good job of giving it away. and. We're going. To, um, we're doing a little mini burn. We're going to uh, El Swens this next weekend, so oh. we're taking a bunch of that food up there. Good. Uh, the next one is gifting. So we're talking about giving away food. Um, you are recommended to bring things to give away, and that can be your spirit. There is no real. I give you the breath from my lungs. What is that? That's from Doctor Who. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. He just breathed on him. He that just breathes on him. Yeah. That was like the restaurant at the end of the universe kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Yeah. I've, I've only seen like the first season and a half or something, but I did see that. Yeah. Uh, next one, decommodification. So it is the only money uh, you can have out there, or the only use that for money other than like interpersonal exchanges. If you want to use money, which you don't, is um, for ice, and you can buy coffee at, down at the camp, but. Decommodification, and you're supposed to cover up all the logos. Like if you drive a rental truck, you're supposed to change it. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so mm. like your Winnebago should be I didn't Pinnebago. See, yeah, or... I didn't see any logos. You kind of notice that. Um, it's getting a little bit harder, I think, a lot because um, there's the Winnebago, like the RV culture, didn't really used to be there. The first time I went in 2006, there was like you no didn't, RVs. You didn't, not no RVs, but you just they didn't stand out, and now they're just everywhere ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a big thing. It's kind of hard to. A lot of the people who are showing up in RVs, too, that you're going to have more often, they will be the, I don't give a shit nearly as much, or I'm new here, you mm-hmm. know, I haven't, like, because I show up with, like, stuff, you know, a truck full of stuff, and my truck turns into a camp rather than bringing a tent on wheels, so. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you're supposed to cover up all your logos, and um, you're not really supposed to participate in any sort of commercial culture. And yeah, I would say the most logoing or advertising I saw was definitely call 1-800-RENTALS to find yourself an RV. Yeah, rvacrossamerica.com or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, and there were some stuff covered up, and I was thinking it would be kind of nice uh, to, like, have a camp whose whole specific goal is just go just around and cover people's covers oh, logos. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> or, like, stickers that say, not your logo here. Right, yeah. Um, Dot com. Number four, radical self-reliance. So Burning Man is a very intense place to be. Uh, it is a, it is an ancient dry lake bed, uh, and it is dusty. It is not sandy. It does not really qualify as a desert in what the desert is occurring to you in your brain, and it's going to take every ounce of will that you have to survive there. So show up prepared to lean on yourself. It will test your will for it sure. Will. So, yeah. radical self-expression, which is, uh, you know, come ig- with the expressed intent of being very unique. Uh, if your idea of expressing yourself is taking your clothes off, that is welcome. 
if your idea of expressing yourself is having more clothes on than everyone else, that is welcome. There really are no rules other than you should really kind of like stretch the rules, I guess. You mm -hmm. know, like the idea is uh, make up a rule and then break it in a lot of ways. Um, anyone, I'm trying to think of, let's see, like people on stilts and circus performers and people who bring a bar and people who bring restaurants and what else? How, what's something, think of self-expression. Um, did anything jump out at you? Hmm. People expressing themselves, poets, musicians, DJs. Yeah, there was some artist stuff. I really like the weird Mad Lot. Maxi people who would go around like there's a guy death with camp. Close, yeah, death camp, the death guild. Yeah, the but uh, there was one guy next to us uh, for a while who just had Twizzlers, and he was like, yeah. and he <laughs> that's was like true. Remember that? That was yeah, and he had a, had a really crazy mask on, kind yeah, of like, uh, like Gary, come here, put this in your face, put it in your body, put this in your body. Yeah, it was so great. <laughs> and he was yelling that for like a good twenty minutes, thirty. No, minutes. dude, a lot. It was like a couple hours. Think so? Yeah, I saw him several times too. Yeah, well, either way, that was he that was, was expressing excellent. himself. It was yeah, great. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. so. If you wanted a killer red vine, that's a place <laughs> to get. <laughs> I hope that's his name. <laughs> that's him. It is now. Yeah. Hey, killer red vine. Yeah. I want to put one of those in my body. Yep. Uh, communal effort. So we all come together as a group to make Burning Man what it is. Uh, if you show up with nothing, which is possible, I do not recommend that at all. It Don't do is it. possible to survive Burning Man because usually everybody brings twice as much as they need mm -hmm. because someone's going to show up looking for something. For example, I had a, um, a tire blowout uh, and I got a free tube from the person who broke my tube but that also ruined my tire and i got a free tire from a bike camp whose job is to fix bikes fix bikes so next year i will uh show up at their camp with a tire to replace the one they used because mm. i greatly appreciate yeah that. but no one really sees it as their job yeah know? yeah, yeah. Like, and they don't expect me to show up with a tire they just expect me to pass it on like whatever it right. is that i brought to the burn they assume that i am giving something away and that that value is equal to a tire oh my god society could work that way uh, oh it's amazing yeah i, I think also it's great because <clears throat> there's none of that like uh, like if you walk up to a bar, especially because everything's free, there's there's not that power exchange where it's like, all right, I expect a drink. Give me a drink now, please. Like none of that. Yeah, and that's another – that's a really good point. If you go to a bar expecting a drink, the chances of you getting one drop. Very low. <laughs> yeah, very low. You should low. expect the bartender to fuck with you. There's a lot of – so like you can only bring so much alcohol, and especially if you have a really nice-looking bar, like you have a good entrance that like really captures people's attention and draws people in, right? So you could be on a street with three or four bars – and but you're doing the best job of attracting people's attention. I don't know. Maybe you have some sort of dangling little anglerfish light, and you're attracting all of your prey. Suddenly, your bar is very full, and having a full bar all week, you might not have brought that much alcohol. So it is you, as the bartender's job, to slow the line down. I actually did um, go to. It was like a. They had like five Slurpee machines, each one with two. Uh, like Slurpee things. I think they had two. Were you, you, yeah, you and I did that. And oh yeah. Um, they had, so they had 10 possible drinks. I think th most of them were alcoholic. Two of them weren't. And the guy did say to us, he's like, well, I guess I should check your ID. And we were digging through the bag. And he's like, take it all the time you want. This is the whole point. We're slowing the line down. Yeah. So you do have to um, – you do uh, have to like kind of like meter how things are going because it is possible, especially with something like alcohol, to just like suddenly mm -hmm. run out. And then what fun would that be? You spend mm -hmm. the rest of the week not have, being a bar. I would also say one of the only rules – at Burning Man is about consent, that there needs to be like an, yep. an equivalency of, of consent. And I, it never happened to me, but I would not be surprised from the culture there if you went up to someone and you're like, hey, give me a drink. And they're like, no. <laughs> yeah. And that, that would be that. And what would you do, right? Yeah, exactly. You'd have to be like, <laughs> yeah. And you should expect the bartender to fuck with you and take their sweet ass time making you a drink. It's not what do you want, it's what's your name, where do you come from? Mm hmm. You know, what have you been up to? How you doing? Let's hang out. Let's, yeah. And by the time you've done talking, maybe then your friends, and then your friend might want to give you a drink. That's, exactly. That's more of the experience you're going to get at Burning Man. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, Next one, civic responsibility. Burning Man is a city. Yeah. It is a pop-up city. It is not a festival. There are elements of it which will remind you of a festival, but really it just blows the, the, the idea, the definition of festival straight out of the water. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and it is your responsibility as a citizen, a good citizen. Greetings, citizen. Greetings. I'll hail the man. I'll hail the man. Uh, it is your uh, civic responsibility to help make Burning Man what it is. And um, 
Leave No Trace is the next one, but one of your responsibilities is to pick up and keep the place nice and clean. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm trying to think what else would be. A so, civic civic responsibility? Well, yeah, and like if you came across someone who was in trouble, you would be expected yeah. to help or to Looking help deliver them to another. someone who can help. Um, I never saw anyone <laughs> get in any like fights or anything like that. Yeah, I saw, no, I saw zero violence. Zero violence, zero. But it's also because everyone's there for each other. Mm -hmm. Like it in certain places in downtown Denver or whatever, you could be getting your ass whooped on the street and no one would come and help you. Yeah. You know, maybe not no one, but the chances there are, there's a chance no one would help you in burning man. Everyone's there for each other. Mm -hmm. So you don't even get to a fight in the first place, right? You couldn't because you're not fighting one person. You're fighting <laughs> the whole city. <laughs> anyway, Hey guys, stop fighting. It's not cool. Yeah. Number eight, leave no trace. This is the big one for me. This is what makes Burning Man, Burning Man, in my opinion. Mm. This is the most important thing, um, which I think that every festival on the planet needs to adopt because, you know, we as good citizens, as uh, little chunks of consciousness running around on our conscious rock, it is our responsibility to grow and to take care and garden. Our, our situation and our environment around us. Our Mother Earth, yeah. Yeah, and so um, if we went to Burning Man every year and we left a bunch of shit, very literally, like feces everywhere and our tents and our sleeping bags, if we left all of that stuff out there, <clears throat> it would very quickly stop being Burning Man. Even if the BLM didn't care that we were fucking the place up and we just came back and fucked it up more and more. That's the Bureau of Land Management. Yeah, they, know that. they are in charge of that piece of property. And it is like it is a it is a wasteland in terms of uh, usable land. I'm sure the government was like, "Hey, this place might be good to blow up, so let's hang on to it." That's pretty much I think their opinion of the land. And so when a bunch of people came along and said, "We were gonna burn a bunch of shit to the ground and party real hard," and they were like, "Well, you better do it out there where we don't care about anything." Mm -hmm. So, um, but also a great <clears throat> place to take care of the land. A great yeah. place to appreciate and support the, the ecosystem there. Yeah, and it and it and it's like lack of value to the government does not in any way convey a lack of value at all because it is a very magical place if for no other reason than it is trying to kill you. Yeah. It is a very deadly place. You would not survive. You you couldn't walk across it without I mean, you could walk the short distance across it, maybe, but you'd need a wagon full of water, I think. I, it'd probably take you, like, two days. So that it'd take you three you'd days need, to get all the way across it, probably. Yeah, so you'd need, like, to have three gallons That's assuming back. you wouldn't be stopping to cook food and sleep, too. Yeah, so you need a backpack, you need three days worth of food and three days worth of water just to walk across it because you're not going to find anything alive. You, you can't, like, it's not, even if you were completely comfortable eating bugs, you would starve to death because there's nothing alive out there, man. There's a couple bugs. Yeah, but they came with the people, I'm pretty sure. You think? The beetles? No, there are some beetles. Well, there's there. like kind of a flat beetle, which I think lives nearby, mm -hmm. and they probably, like, they can fly a bit, so they see the light and they show up. But I don't think you'd find a bug out there if you were just all by yourself. Yeah, probably not. It's I'm, pretty brutal out there. I mean, if you ever want, if you ever seen a, if you want to see a slow fly, go to Burning Man because everyone shows up and there's flies like in their stuff, and the flies get out and they're like, "Oh, where are we?" Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's almost sad. Yeah, you can touch flies; they don't even fly away. They're like, "I don't care, I'm dying." Yeah. Anyway, so leave no trace is important because uh, if we didn't leave no trace, it would only take a couple of years for us to basically ruin the place, and uh, it would that would end Burning Man right there. But yep. Not only do we want Burning Man to happen, we want the world to be a better place. And like the the those kinds of things that we see happening in Burning Man are the kinds of things that I want to bring back to the real world. And especially because, the festivals. It's a beacon of light in the festival culture. Yeah, that the one thing about festivals, you have your irresponsible raver types who just leave their shit behind, and that is just the worst. Well, it's part of the consumerist nature of our world right now that everything's disposable. Mm -hmm. Our planet is not disposable. Yeah. But, I mean, and, and that, that's a funny viewpoint to have, too, because if anything, we are disposable. The planet's right. not going anywhere. But I guarantee you that if we piss it off too much, it's going to ditch us. Yeah. Yeah. In, it, a very, I mean, in a very conscious manner. I don't just mean like, oh, we fucked up the environment and killed ourselves. Like, I, there's no reason to think that the, the environment around us will not respond negatively to our negative mm -hmm. aspects mm -hmm. and boot us. And vice versa, though, too, that there's a good reason to garden and, like, in that way of conserving and loving and creating harmony because – how much stuff there is on this planet to help take care of us we really have everything we need mm -hmm. it's we just are kind of dicks about it so this is a great way in the opposite direction and also i mean if just go google, google images of post festival chaos and you will see the kind of just terrible waste that human beings can leave behind mm -hmm. you know i mean like there are thousands of bikes that are abandoned every mm -hmm. year and there's quite a few people who like stick behind to like steal those bikes 
to pick up uh, after. And then there are a couple of there are donation places. Too. Yeah, there are a couple of organizations. Um, I think Burnworks and Reno is the big one, mm-hmm. uh, and they specifically have places to drop a bike uh, as you're headed out if you are not planning on keeping your bike. And they will reuse it and probably likely bring it back to the burn next year, or they might a couple of places sell it, and the money that they use gets donated to. Uh, good charities and those kinds of things. Good. So, number nine, participation. Mm. Uh, so you, you, there. Um, I don't know how to say that, but like, don't be a tourist. You know, you're not. It's like, experiential. Yeah. If you show up and you just expect to kind of like walk around and take pictures of the things that are happening around you, rather someone than someone might slap your phone out of your hand. Yeah, there's a really good chance that you will get. Someone will fuck with you. Someone out there will, even if they don't know that's what they're doing, they will sense the need of you to, like, stop, to get you out of your box. Yeah. And they will tear you from your comfort zone. Which is, oh, God, so great. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the environment, too, will tear you out of your comfort zone. If you mm-hmm. think you're going to, like, go to Burning Man and just hang out and have fun. I mean, you might because you're, like, one of those rich people who can, like, pay to have that experience, you know, and you might not experience the real burn. But some portion of you is going to experience the real burn, and hopefully that will drive you back to, like, get a real picture of it but mm-hmm. you're expected to participate which is you know dress up like a weirdo have fun interact with the the people around you you could that could mean anything chasing a ball around on the street or getting or, naked yeah getting into a fight with a chicken mm-hmm. it'd be a play fight of course but um yeah all so. kinds of stuff can happen but yeah i think the the experiential part of it is also uh, ingrained in the art a lot of the art that's out yeah. there is stuff you can climb on and touch and use and play and uh, experience. Yeah. I'd say almost all of it. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Very little art is just like, well, I'm going to stand here and look at this. So don't do that. Yeah. And then last is immediacy. And honestly, I don't get it. Immediacy. Yeah. Um, where do these, where do these come from? Uh, so these were written in 2004 by, um, Mr. Harvey, the guy who's kind of credited. I guess immediacy. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I just say that he's the guy who's kind of the center point of Burning Man. He's kind of, the guy who created it. There's a team of people, but he is the name you hear most. Does of. he like go back every year? Yeah, I've seen him once. Huh. Uh, he was on a lift, but somebody's like, "Oh, that's Harvey right there," and I was like, "Oh, yeah." <laughs> I was like, I, "I've seen a picture of him, and that does look like the picture I saw." Well, I think the immediacy it means that like the things are going to happen spontaneously around you, and like, the, and you're expected to sort of jump in as it's as it's occurring. Yeah, and I, I think I, th- I think the feeling I got from it was like live in the now. Like yeah. it isn't a, the Burning Man is an experience that is happening to you, and rather than worrying about where you're from and where you're going, you are in the now. So mm-hmm. I kind of think that's what it was going. But it's a pretty confusing paragraph, to be perfectly honest. So I do not uh, expect anyone to believe that I know what that means. Well, the nice thing about <clears throat> nowness and immediacy is you're already there. Congratulations, you've accomplished it. You're here. Yeah. Uh, so as far as expectations in Burning Man, I did want to read a little quote from a friend who was her first time at the burn. Which uh, friend is this? Um, this is Vanessa. Oh, nice. Yeah, and, and she said, um, let's see, she said, uh, anyhow, I've been surprised at how disoriented and reintegra- disorienting reintegration has been. And it's kind of knocked me on my ass. And I was like, oh, I'd be interested to hear about that. I'll give you a call. And she hit me with a text shortly thereafter, and she she said, actually, I think I'm pretty clear on where it came from. Nobody in my intimate circle has any sort of context for the experience that I just went through. Everything that they think Burning Man is is a misconception. The sheer magnitude of it alone, and then the isolation upon returning home, creates an odd sense of loneliness. Mm -hmm. It seems akin to the experience people have where post-trauma, where nobody in their life really gets it, is pretty heavy for a bit, simultaneously fascinating, it's never occurred to me that it could occur with a positive experience. Connecting with other burners seemed to remedy it rather quickly. An interesting experiment. Yeah, I uh, I was like sort of reminiscing about Burning Man the other day when I was setting up a sound system, and then a musician there was like, you got back from Burning Man? I was like, yeah, man, what's up? And he's like, oh, man, and he showed me his water bottle had like, you know, the fucking Burning Man symbol on it. And he's like, yeah, I went I've been going for seven years. It's the first year I didn't go. And immediately I felt this sense of like connection mm. That I didn't feel, I've now I haven't felt, felt since being there. So it's a testament to the community that you can either feel connected or lonely from not talking to burners or not being around those kinds of people because you can't, you know, you don't get it. It's like being, I'm sure, like a a football player or something, and you could like tell people like, yeah, I played national football and da 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 da. But if you meet someone else who did it, you know, you're gonna have a kind of bond. Mm-hmm. Or what's another? Maybe like the army. Mm-hmm. Right? Lots of people are gonna feel that way. So. In crowds, out crowds, culture, that's how it works. Yeah, totally. 
So, uh, how to survive Burning Man. Um, <clears throat> That's first, important. Yeah, so the first thing that uh, is really, really important to understand is that Burning Man is a really super harsh environment. It is not a normal place for people to hang out. It is not a desert. When you think of a desert, you know, cactuses and uh, old men leaned up against the cactus with a hat to shade their face. Probably mm, a dog no. panting in the sun. No. no, there's there's literally, when you're standing at Burning Man, it is about two to three miles to the nearest plant, and that plant isn't really green. <laughs> <laughs> you literally cannot see the color green. Mm-mm. Everything is somewhere between a white, beige, gray. Um, if you imagine, like, the most cloudy day you could possibly imagine, just, like, everything is super gray, that's a very normal Burning Man. You might have, like, blue skies. It looks like Tatooine. Yeah, pretty much. A little bit more gray than, than yellow. Yeah, it's less sandy. It's, yeah. it's got this kind of... Yeah, dust is the only word for it. You yeah, know? it's yeah. dusty. It's not sandy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, the dust is an ancient dry lake, lake bed, and it's got a very low pH yes, because low. it is basic. Alkaline. Alkaline, exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, so that means a couple of things. Number one, you're going to want some sort of um, filter to put over your mouth, an actual dust mask of some sort. I just use a scarf when it gets bad. I'm not really bothered by the dust nearly as much. You seem to have that fucking superpower, though. <laughs> I mean, the first day that I got there, I, I like felt, I was like, oh, after like an hour of being in the sun, too, and like working and putting up shade structure and stuff, I could feel the dust coating like the inside of my nose and the back of my mouth. And I was like, oh, like, oh, my, oh my God. And then I went and I grabbed my scarf and my goggles and I'm like, a little better. But I, after the first couple of days, you know, I, I definitely acclimated to it, but still needed the goggles. Yeah, and I like as we pulled out onto the dirt, I could smell the dust getting kicked up. Like, like it has a very specific smell, and I smelled it for a second, and then that was instantly acclimated. Yeah. So, and I don't, I rarely have goggles on me. Uh, it doesn't really bug my eyes. But even when it's not windy and stuff, everybody's kicking up dust. You'll be in like kind of a soup. Like there's a general haze of dust that's probably 14 or 15 feet tall. Everywhere you mm-hmm. go is dust, pure dust all the time. Like, when there is a dust storm, though, you can see it coming like a cloud. Yeah. Like you can see in the distance, like, oh my God, there's like a, wa- it's like a, a wall, like a wave, yeah, coming toward Like me. just watch uh, the new Mad Max. That's pretty much what you need. Just no, gr- I haven't, I haven't actually grayer. seen that. Oh, that's pretty fun, actually. Is it any good? Yeah, totally. No. Let's look at a picture of Ryan uh, getting introduced to the burn here. Me? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Here's Ryan ringing the bell. Uh, show this to our to our audience here. Yeah, that's this is going to be on me. Uh, uh, I forgot that that picture right. even got taken. Here, go put hold it up to the other camera. He's looking at the other one. There you go. See? There we go. Yeah. So once you when you get to the gate, uh, you ring a bell and you scream, "I am no longer a virgin." And you also roll around in the dust. And they make you roll in the dust, which is actually a really good practice because you need to get dirty as fast as possible and get over that feeling. Because yeah. I definitely, my first time at Burning Man, I struggled. Because I was like, I've never I'd never really been that dirty before in my life. And I was just like, oh, I'm so dirty. Ugh. And, you know, just like, it just gets to you until you're just finally like, okay, I'm, I Surrender. am dirty. Mm-hmm. I am the dust. Yeah. Which I like to say, be one with the dust. Become one with the dust. So that is the, that is the first major hurt obstacle you're going to overcome at Burning Man is the fact that you are just dirty. Well, I dirty, can tell too. The, dirty, dirty, dirty. Yeah. The greeter guy, when he was like, <clears throat> when he brought me out, you guys had sort of mentioned that he might make me roll around in the dust. I thought it was kind of a joke. But when I got there and he mentioned it, I could tell he was sort of timid, like maybe not everybody who actually shows up there does it. But also, I realized, like, looking around, like, oh, this is important. I'm going to have to really get into this really fast. And I loved rolling around in it. it yeah. Very fun. So, uh, yeah, get acclimate to the dust. Step two. It's hot. It's super hot. Um, you will wear out around 2, 1 o'clock, 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the sun has been beating down on you all day. And you will feel extremely de- defeated. Um, you will if you're struggling with the dust as well the combination of the heat and the dust uh will beat you down it is an experience you are um getting to burning man is a whole thing i need to cover that too Mm -hmm. um but the big thing that you will understand about burning man is that it is a survival experience it's fucking difficult yeah it's really fucking difficult i mean i i loved it i love it was difficult Mm -hmm. i loved the difficulty though it was it was like a really good hard game yeah, I like the surviving aspects of things. I love mm-hmm. I love camping. I love winter camping. Mm-hmm. So the difficulty is one of the things I really enjoy. And the very interesting thing about that is that there's a kind of person who cannot handle that kind of situation, and uh, they will not do very well at Burning Man or not go at all. Or and leave. 
Yeah. There were so, some people <clears throat> who left that I saw. Yeah, totally. And what, what happens is that all of the people who stay and enjoy Burning Man have this very, like, a common bond of, like, I don't mind the difficulty. Mm-hmm. And so right then and there, you already have this camaraderie of, like, when you walk up to somebody at Burning Man and you give them a hug because shaking is not a thing. There are some little bit of handshakes, but most people are like, you go straight to the hug. It's a very loving community. But part of the the genuine community and the hugging, the aspects, the love that comes from like, dude, you made it. Yeah, like you survived. Congratulations, you fucking made it. Yeah. Uh, that is a, it's a really big deal. How beautiful. Yeah. yeah that's super beautiful. Yeah, so it's hot. And it's going to drag you down. And the big thing is water. So my um, my recommendation is to carry a camelback. I make sure everyone has a camelback. Because what happened to me, I bought a camelback my first year. Uh, but the real secret for me was when I figured out that I could fill my camelback with ice and then fill the rest with water. And I would have cold water for a good six hours or so. Mm-hmm. And um, It cools your body down. You need yeah, it. Yeah, drinking <clears throat> freezing cold water just... Um, oh, catal- I want to say catalyze. What's the, like, put a shields up, you know? Like, it just... It does. Energetically, it puts those shields up. Yeah. I mean, I it may, the first thing I thought about was, like, all those shitty studies. That, like, don't drink ice water. Ice water shocks your systems. Well, you've never been in 100-degree sun. Yeah. Because it's clearly so good for you. Yeah. Your body just craves it. Yeah. I, it was, uh, a, I spent two or three days suffering my first time at the burn, and then I figured out the cold water trick, and it changed my life. Yeah, well, I thought when you first mentioned it, it was because, like, maybe it kept your back cold or something like that, but no, you just, you need to be ingesting that cold water yeah. as often as possible. Yeah, it's a, it's a life-changing experiment. Yeah, experience. it's also, it's easy to forget to drink. You'd think, like, oh, I'm in a desert. I'm, I'll drink when, like, I need to. No, you need to drink three times more than that yeah. because it's just brutal. Yep. And the other, so the other part of the having a backpack full of water is the backpack aspect. So um, you are – it's an extreme form of camping, and you should be prepared to basically get towed off into the nothingness at any given point. Like, anything could happen. Or get lost or Yeah, and if you don't – well, for one thing, everything, it's, it's leave no trace. So that means that, like, uh, at camp, we usually have paper plates and stuff because we can burn them in the fire because Burning Man, Burning Man is normal. You know, burning trash is normal. We don't burn plastic. Um, but as part of that, you're expected to have your own plate and silverware and cup um, because that cuts down all the trash, which just makes life a lot easier. And I actually think that's one of the main things I would really like to bring back from the burn in general. I think society should embrace cup culture. How Every- the fuck have we not? Yeah. It well, would be so much cheaper and so much better for us. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Is it cheaper? Ah, you're right. I, I mean, somebody who's else gonna, is not who, making money. Yeah, who's going to pay to make things cheaper? Well, it's crazy to even think You're not going to get your money back. It's crazy to think that, like, what a congressman would say to you, right? He's like, well, the paper plate industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Think of all the jobs that are going to be lost from the paper plate industry. Like, yeah, okay, maybe, like, that, there's some nuance to that argument, but mostly... What a fucking waste yep. when you just think about how not difficult it is to have one plate that, like, that's your plate and you clean it. You know, and it doesn't even have to be, like, a chore like it dishes. This is something that occurred to me at Burning Man. You think, like, oh, I like using plastic water bottles or whatever because uh, I don't want to carry a water bottle around all the time. But the nice thing about Burning Man was having that, like, that water container on me and my cup and I did have a fork and a spoon and a plate that I kept with me. It was like those were my... Those were mine. You know, those like were my items that kept me alive. And mm-hmm. it's much easier if like you use it, you wash it, you keep it on you. Yep. That's not the same thing as like piling up dishes and then like, oh, I have to do dishes. It's uh, it's just part of your like survival kit. Yep. I and love it, seeing people with them too. Carry a knife. Knife. Because there's knife. lots of like strings and tying things down. You have to protect stuff from the wind. Um, it's just a very camping experience. So the, the knife is part of surviving. So um, always have a knife. And let's see what light. else. Light. You need light. Light, yeah. Okay, so that's the that's a big one, too. Um, you need light to see, and then you need light to be seen. So it is a very dark place out there, and uh, you can easily get run into and run over uh, if people can't see you coming. So everyone has a light on. That can be as simple as just having a headlamp, uh, but don't shine it in people's faces, which is rude. Mm-hmm. Um, but most people will have, like, some sort of, like, more of a creative aspect to the lighting, you know, like some sort of halo. Um, you know, you can just, like, wrap an LED string around your head or whatever you want, but mm-hmm. um, it's as simple as just having a light hanging off of you. So, um, 
What else? I was, I was trying to think of that back. What else would you find in a backpack? You care, these days that people are IDing because there is a heavy law enforcement presence and I'll, I'll just do a whole thing on law enforcement in a bit, but um, yeah. you are expected to carry your ID. You can put a photocopy and just tape it to your bottle. Most people will accept mm -hmm. that. I've never seen that turned down. So, but there is, they do want to make sure that they're not um, feeding drinks to minors because that it will get the event shut down. I do not think that that's a real I problem. I didn't see many minors there. Yeah, I don't see, there's, the kids kind of stick out, but I'm well, sure there's the, like I'm kids, sure the, kids. There's like you know under twelve kids. Yeah, but, but I don't. There I isn't see a lot anyone of anyone who's like a teenager. But yeah, I'm sure that like the sixteen to twenty year old crew, they probably sleep all day and then they just go rage at the rave camps or something. So yeah. I'm not really sure. I mean, there's that's not. You know, nothing is a hard, fast rule at Burning Man. So. Right. Also, there's so much sexy stuff. There's like the kink scene and whatnot. So that's obviously 21 plus. And yeah, and you definitely, you definitely monitored. want to. Consent is the big thing at Burning Man. Yeah. Everything is consensual, including taking photographs. If you're planning on taking a camera, I haven't heard them talk too much about it. But back in the day before the cell phone thing, you had if you were bringing a real camera, you had to go to center camp and get it get registered. Mm -hmm. And if you saw someone taking pictures and they didn't have the like the little tag hanging off of their camera, you could report them. Break their camera. Yeah, Just snap. It. And technically, all the images you take at Burning Man belong to Burning Man, which yeah. is on the back of the ticket as well. Um, but that's mm. mostly meant to protect you, uh, like because there's a lot of nudity at, at Burning Man because it's self-expression and openness, and it's a very, um, it's a. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too because it's a cool culture aspect too. Um, yeah, but I mean, but it's I, protect I didn't the person take... who is nude and doesn't want their photo taken. If you take their photo. That photo then belongs to Burning Man, and Burning Man has the right to go and sue the photographer for taking a non-consensual photo. That's yeah. where all that comes from. It's, yeah. pro it's protecting the person's individual rights. Burning Man has no real intention in owning anything. That is for um, – that's the protection of consent. It would be very anti-Burning Man anyway. Yeah, totally. But uh, I, I was – it really wasn't until like the sixth or seventh day that I was like, oh, shit, I should take some pictures because it was uh, – it just – it the, something about the experiential nature of it – really makes you forget about so maybe that's part of what the immediacy means you know it's not like we're taking pictures so that we can remember this and talk to our friends about it it's like you're there be there while it's happening yeah and even when i took pictures i was like yeah 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 like i'm gonna take so that people know some of the shit i was talking about when i was gonna reference it but i didn't really want to you know so i think that's a big ups to their culture for creating that immediacy yeah uh, other things in your backpack you need a little bit of food you're going to get hungry. You're biking around all over the place. You could probably find food, but I say you got to have a snack on yep, you. Yeah, have a snack. Think of it as like a long hike. Mm -hmm. You know, you and you honestly like it's not impossible to just disappear for like a day or two. Like you never know. Or you'll make friends, you'll go back to their camp, you'll end up crashing there. Who knows? Or you'll ingest a couple entertaining substances and you'll kind of forget you even have a camp. Like mm -hmm. Burning Man is an infinite experience and anything could possibly happen and you want to be prepared for that. Yep. And uh, I'm being a Boy Scout, so I suggest uh, you want to be fully prepared with a backpack full of, like, useful items. But you better be. I mean, I, I, I think it's bad for you not to be prepared in that way. And yeah, it's half the experience. Yeah, and you could become a burden rather than, like, a participant in mm -hmm. those particular cases. So mm -hmm. uh, what we did, we did the light, the knife, the cup, the silverware. You got water in there. You probably want to layer. It gets cold at night, so yeah, it it's hot all day, and then it's cold. Oh, this year was kind of an exception to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big uh, hitchhiker's guy to the universe fan bring a towel i mean a scarf everywhere you go everywhere you go Gotta bring a towel it's a uh, universal weapon no i think uh the scarf honestly is so good for so many things i'll list them now because <laughs> i'm i'm a huge scarf where's my damn scarf i have uh, it. hold on a sec hold on join us as he gets a scarf <laughs> i let's see which side is left and right here i Love scarves. See, I've got a scarf. So, scarves are amazing, and here are some reasons you want that at Burning Man. One, it can cover your face. That's really important, because it's going to be dusty, and you're going to be breathing stuff in, and there are going to be times where, like, you're biking, and you've got your scarf on, and, like, a car pulls in front of you very slowly, and it's just, like, dust cloud, dust cloud. Like, you need, you need a scarf for that. Um, two, you can put it over your head. And it will shade you. That's an, I didn't do a great job, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, for me, that's the neck. The it's neck. always covering the back of your neck from the But you sun can put it up and it'll it. do both. I mean, if it's on your neck all the time, then yeah. it's always shading your neck. But if you put it up, then it shades both your neck and your ears. And more than anything, I've got black hair. So I, get no I notice immediately. I got a bunch of white scarves that I brought. But I, like, immediately notice less heat 
uh, on, in my body temperature when I cover my black hair with a white scarf because I'm no longer just like <laughs> absorbing all the light that is coming to me. Um, so those are two uses. Uh, another one is that you can get it wet. You can wet your sarong or scarf and then like wrap it around you. That'll keep you nice and cool. Um, you can also bandage something if you like cut yourself or something. The number one thing you always need to do when you uh, have any kind of serious cut is apply pressure. And scarves can be a great way to do that because you just tie it around it. Um, what are other things? You can carry things with it. You can turn it into a like a knapsack or a little bag to carry things. You can do... Uh, you could strangle someone with it. You could... Not uh, recommended. Not recommended. Only in the cases of self-defense. Of course. And... Uh, I don't know. There's there's probably other uses I can't think of, but scarves. I would say that would be one you need. Sun, to dust, and fashion. Those are the big ones. Yeah, yeah. And and keeping cool. Yeah. <laughs> Looking like, so cool that. and keeping cool. There you go. All forms of it. Um. So we said scarf, cup, knife, light. I think that's pretty much everything you need, really. Well, yeah, and the, the backpack also keeps a place for move, so everyone's right. expected to have a little bag on your hip to put trash as it blows past you. Yep, or if you smoke cigarettes, a little thing to ash your cigarette into. Yeah, bring an ashtray for yourself. All of your butts go into the trash, which you might not be anywhere nearby at the time, so you have to have your own little trash can in your pocket. It won't be anywhere nearby. Yeah. I know you smokers. You're out there smoking all over the place. There's not very many trash cans, so... Yeah. And most everyone, there's a smoker within reach, and they will have a can in their pocket if you've forgotten. So, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. but that's a really big deal. Leave no trace is a huge thing. I would, I will bite your head off quite literally. Uh, Many if people. If I will. see you throwing your butt on oh, the ground, and they should, they should. It's a dick thing to do, no matter what. I mean, to think about how many venues, like God, if that was just the one thing that we took away, is like, stop throwing your fucking cigarette butts all over the place. Yeah. No, no, no offense out there to you cigarette smokers. No, I'm, I intend to offend you. God you damn it. <laughs> I just like, I've thrown a lot of events at venues and like the number one thing I have to go back and clean up every time is wherever everyone was smoking. Yeah. I know when I owned a theater for a while, I didn't own it. I rented a theater for a while and ran it. Um, it was at a church and they loved us. But like the one thing that was constantly an issue was that right outside of our front door after shows, it was just fucking cigarette butt island. And we would put different canisters out there like with signs like, please put your cigarette butts in here. And still people would flick them off and stomp on them and shit. Yeah. And I, per- I, would, I personally am all for a law that says if you see someone throw a cigarette butt on the ground, you can slap them across the just face open-handed. <laughs> I would even a backhand. I'm cool with that too, man. Mm. Full wind-up. Yeah. Uh, I'm not worried about offending cigarette smokers because clearly cigarette smokers are bad people. <laughs> I'm not willing to go that far. but uh, oh, that's, I w- that's very nice of you. Yeah. Just, probably because you don't smoke cigarettes and you're a very nice person. Oh, thanks. I, I used to. Not like cigarettes, but I smoke tobacco sometimes. And I, our good friend uh, rolls his own. He does have – he brings filters, but, mm-hmm. you know, if you're – you can't throw it on the ground. You absolutely cannot throw it on the ground, but at least he's – left with some paper and some tobacco rather than a uh, piece of petrochemical foam uh, with mixed fiber, with fiberglass glass fiber, apple shavings and yeah. shit. Anyway, so um, Rat prepare to go anywhere with your backpack full of survival items, including a lot of water. And you mm-hmm. should have uh, at least a gallon of water per day. gallon and a half is what's suggested. Yeah. Uh, and we go, we only did a gallon per person per day, basically. We got nowhere Probably near that. But we're also like... Uh, we generate a lot of water by melting ice and mm-hmm. stuff, none mm-hmm. of which we're using uh, too much. But uh, Which you, we could have been better about that, too. I think uh, yeah. like the coolers, if you make sure that your food doesn't contaminate the ice water that's melting, then that can become other form. But our, that water got contaminated a bunch when we were there. So. Yeah, and I've got... I'm going to try and see if I can get around that next year. So uh, another big thing uh, is drive. when you get to the burn, you'll be driving in, presumably... Well, you have to drive in. You literally have to drive in. You cannot walk into Burning Man whatsoever. If you walk to Burning Man, you'll have to get into someone's car to cross the line into Burning Man. That's just a rule. Part of it's because— You can bus in. It's literally a federal highway, uh, which gives the cops jurisdiction to, like, police that situation, which is a good— some mostly good. There's a little bit of negative there, too, but it is a federal highway, and you cannot walk on federal highways. Um— 
So in order to keep the dust down, the speed limit is uh, 10 miles approaching and five miles in five miles per hour in the city. Uh, you cannot drive your vehicle at Burning Man without a license for your vehicle, and they will not give you a license if your vehicle is a normal vehicle. So the only things you see running around at Burning Man are art cars. And they're awesome. So if you show up with uh, something and you just tape a bunch of golf balls to it and you think that's an art car and you take it to them, they might disagree with you and they will not give you a license. And if you drive it anyway, you will be ticketed rather expensively i think that's like 500 bucks if you're driving around without an art car without a license and they have stickers there's a whole line the art cars all line up at the beginning of the month beginning of the week and uh to get their licenses to drive around so well the art cars are really cool too if you i don't think we talked about it last episode so uh if you have any inclination to make a really cool car that goes slowly do that because they were really fun yeah there was a the new there's a new car out there this year that was from a Colorado camp that was like a giant willow tree mm -hmm. it was really awesome you could barely even see the tree there were so many tendrils hanging down from it um what else the Mayan our car we kind of talked about the cultural mm -hmm. appropriation of the Mayan warrior but yeah. that's it's a giant it was so fucking cool though <laughs> it's yeah, a, it's an excellent piece of art, and it's a it's a sound stage. It's, it's its own like theater sound. I mean, you might it's if Nothing. you went to a Pink Floyd concert at um, Mile High Stadium, I would suggest that this art car is louder than that. It's it's it holds more presence, that's for sure. It's got like these ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen lasers. Yep. that stretch. It seems like an infinity, off into infinity, whichever yeah. direction they go. And I think my one of my favorite things I ever saw actually was when. It created this eyeball effect, like where it was like all of them around, and then it was pulsing with the music, and it was like a giant energy shield, like taking damage. It was, <laughs> oh, it was so cool looking. Oh my god. Yeah, I really enjoyed the lasers out there because there's lots of dust, so you know you can't see a laser without particulates in the air, mm -hmm. which is why when you're in a club, they have the smoke machines. Mm -hmm. That's what. That's what that's all about. Yeah, but I mean the Mayan warrior cultural appropriation aside, which I don't, you know, who knows about all of that. Um, although I'm sure we've got plenty of, to say about it, uh, it was it was you could tell where it was at any time. If you were like the one thing you could always tell you could meet at for somebody's like meet me at the Mayan Warrior wherever it ends up being at that time you could meet there because you could find it no matter what. Yeah, that is a good point. As far as mobile things, um, that's an easily findable thing, which is not usually the case at Burning Man. Mm -mm, so mm -mm. another cool art car is uh, El Popo Mechanical is a like a giant octopus, metal octopus, octopus made out of trash that like moves and shoots massive amounts of flame out of it. And uh, this year, the, that didn't go, but the same artist made El Pulpo Mechanical 2, which was mm. still kind of like nautically themed. I don't remember the sea creature it was, but... Uh, Did you see the giraffe? I didn't. Oh, the giraffe was cool. Oh, wait, the, the, our neighbors? Yeah. Yeah, the robot giraffe. The, the mechanical giraffe. It was yeah. an art car. Yeah. Yeah, and it would, it would like, greet, come down to greet you, and you'd pet it. There were, like, five places to pet it, and when you pet it, it said things. Uh, did you hear the story about that? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Bert, um, Mihai met that guy, and he was riding next to us um, on the art car on the back from the Temple Burns. So. Yep, yep. Yeah, so there is, uh, it's an interactive place, it's an amazing thing, and uh, if you want to be interactive and mobile on wheels, then you have to get a license, so mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. that. How many art cars are there out there? Hundreds, yeah? Hundreds. Like 400, 500, you know? Hmm, that's an interesting question. 400 seems reasonable. It seems about right. I mean, I, there were several art cars I saw where I was like, holy shit, how have I not seen that yet? I'm yeah. like, oh right, it's a giant city. There's a whole troop of cupcakes where... What? You didn't see the cupcakes? No, I didn't. Oh, yeah. So that you sit in a cupcake and then, like, the frosting, like, your head just pokes out of the top of the cupcake. <laughs> and then they usually have, like, a cherry as a hat. Uh, but there's, like, seven or eight cupcakes. They drive around? Yeah. That's and, great. And then uh, let's see if there's anything else that really jumps out at me. There's a bunch of, there's, like, a couple flying carpets. So it's basically just, I like, saw the wheels carpets. on a platform. And so it can fit lots of people. There's I think a really I... cool Colorado cart car that's just a grove of mushrooms. Oh, that's cool. I really liked uh, our campmate Ryan uh, from RE Engineering has, like, this skateboard what do you call it trail something trail i guess he called it the trail board trail board yeah but it's like a how do you how would you describe it um well it is a it's a snowboard but for the dirt and the front is two wheels kind of like a normal skateboard that when you tilt the board it turns the wheels yeah. but then it's only got a single rear wheel that is powered by an engine and then it carries a chariot behind it yeah well it carries a barco lounger basically like a pool a pool chair um and that's interesting because it's not technically an art car because it doesn't have a seat. 
Oh. It's a standing vehicle with towing a trailer. And so that is the one. Uh, that it's like he, a loophole. Yeah, he doesn't have to get it licensed. And that we, there's like three other things we saw. I saw that there's a motorcycle, stand-up motorcycle, like go-ped kind of thing, creation that was also had a trailer. And that's, I think there's one other thing I saw out there that like abuses that loophole. But it's a really good idea. We've always talked about, as a group, like everybody has one. Yeah. So. Um, but it's a pain in the ass. I've ridden it for like two days straight. Well, fuck like, your legs up. Yeah, it's a lot. That's a lot of work. But yeah, it's vi- vibratory, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of bumps all around. So yeah, but Ryan, because of that little vehicle, he's pretty famous, dude. He also looks kind of like just like a road warrior. In he's general. got yeah, he's got that like gothic Mad Max yeah s- snowboard desert riding look. Yeah, he never wears a shirt too for some reason. Yeah. When Which he's is, out there. Oh, speaking of that, sunscreen. I don't use sunscreen. I just expose myself to the sun until I feel the sun is too much, and then I put on a layer. And by the end of the week, I've become sunproof for the most part. I can, like, right now, I could wander out into the sun and be in the sun all day, and I'd be fine. Thanks to a I got significantly at darker. Uh, it's a lot of people commented on that when I got back. Like, yeah, really? Oh, wow, you're I'm a lot darker. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> you're a lot darker. Oh, yeah, my. Uh, so, law enforcement. And uh, we we got to run through these a little quicker. We've been chatting too much. But there there is a heavy law enforcement uh, aspect out there. There's FBI, but they are well hidden. There is... Um, I didn't... Yeah, I didn't see any... There's like a local sheriff, which is kind of like the main presence you see. Mm-hmm. Like a, But they call them rangers. So I'm not sure if it's like a federal level sheriff or something. But anyway, most of what you see is uh, kind of a sheriff level aspect. And I think the side of their truck says ranger. Mm-hmm. There is... Uh, the local police department from the town nearby Gerlach. There are and BLM There's the people. state patrol and there's BLM. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you will like, honestly, like you probably if you get pulled over, you it might be for any kind of like normal taillight out kind of thing or something, or if you're misbehaving or whatever. And they will go looking for. Um, they won't tear your car apart unless they have good reason for the most part. But it's uh, it is now legal to smoke in the state of Nevada, but this but this is on federal property, so it is not marijuana legal to is still en- illegal engage federally. in marijuana. So don't be seen doing it in public. We have a couple of friends who've been busted, but I think that Burning Man is a very karmic place, and they needed to get busted in order to learn that <laughs> lesson. I have not. I don't know anyone who's been busted really any time in recent memory, but I do no. know that it happens, uh, and they do have a large presence out there, and they're very friendly people. Um, I support fully anyone going to Burning Man, including a cop, because he's going to come away from Burning Man with something that I think will improve his life and probably his interaction with the people around him. I so. agree. I agree. But you do have to be. It is a. It is a situation which has law enforcement and a lot of, like, the laws and stuff have come from the interactions of uh, exterior civic mm-hmm. bodies and agencies. Um, but let me say, as someone who, a, like, a uh, who went for the first time, that was, like, the thing I was most sketched out of. I was like, how many cops? And so they're like, oh, they're just walking around. I'm like, what? But it's actually totally fine. Yeah. It's fine. Know, they're, they're not, they're not uh, messing with the culture. They're not interceding. They're not... Doing the standard cop thing, which is like standing on corners, looking tough. I didn't see any of that. Yeah. So. Uh, drones. Don't be a drone. Uh, you have to sign up ahead of time with a drone, and they make there's like five or six drone licenses. Mm-hmm. I did see some pictures today on Facebook of somebody who hook hung a camera from a kite, which is technically legal. Uh, but yeah, don't bring a drone. Uh, if you want to take a drone to Burning Man, you have to get a hold of them ahead of time. You probably have to have some sort of federal drone uh, pilot's license. You know, I'm sure you have to be accredited and all that. So. Um, the wind, wind is super intense. Uh, your normal tent, the, the dirt is not dirt. It is dust and therefore like not nearly as structurally stable as Mm -hmm. uh, a normal dirt and ground. So your normal tent stakes will not hold your tent down. So you need rebar. If you have a, just a normal, like if you have a normal camping tent, you want to go get like the 10 inch spikes that you can get at most places. They're like 89 cents a piece. And if you have an actual structure that is of you know any size bigger than a normal tent you do want rebar or something of the equivalent like a nice you want at least a foot in the dirt Mm -hmm. at least um and expect to like strap everything down um you will probably going to burning man if you go with a group of people you will most likely learn a couple of knots and how a ratchet strap works works i did (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you go with me, you will learn a couple of knots and how a wor- ratchet strap works because there's lots of tying things down. Yeah. This year was actually way easier than usual. Really? Uh, yeah, I was just a little bit more prepared. We had way more ratchet traps. Normally, I bust through an entire roll of rope. So, uh, But anyway, the wind is a serious, serious deal. Uh, when it really picks up, it will spit, you know, like pea-sized rocks at your face, and it really hurts. 
Um, so you have to be prepared for that. Normal tents, normal shade structures and stuff will get squashed. Mm -hmm. And also make sure that it's friendly to the wind. We were lucky to have you guys prepared and engineering stuff, but the tarps that we had had triangle-sized holes cut in them. Yep. So the wind w would pass through it, but wouldn't, like, take it and destroy it. Yeah. Although there was one time we fucked up, and we un uh, we unstaked one of our uh, shade structure pieces, and it very quickly blew away. <laughs> so yeah, I remember that. Oops, that was our yeah. Bad. I was not thinking. Um, it was hot. Yeah, we did have um, we did that one thing did break because we speared. Uh, remember our spear throwing contest, and we we bent one of the little things. Oh, and that it, broke. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> while, while we were gone, I didn't. I did not actually cop to that at the time. That it. Broke. I did. No, no. I remember it breaking. I I was I wasn't there, but yeah. Uh, no, but I went when I went and picked that thing up off the ground. I noticed it was loose. And I was like, oh, that's probably gonna go at some point. Uh, um, but those were terribly made. Like one of Ryan's friends kind of threw those together, and they've made it through like ten years, so they deserve to break. It was time. Um, move on, little rebar. Move on. Bathrooms. It's all porta potties out there. Don't pee on the dirt because your pee is acidic and the ground is uh, basic alkaline, uh, and you will change the chemistry of the area. And if enough people peed on the ground all the time, it would um, it You're would destroy change the, the place. It mm -hmm. would become a different place, and so we definitely don't want that. Uh, plus, if everyone peed on the ground, it would be a disgusting, piss filled place because there's more people than there is space. Additionally, water and the playa are weird. It's this clay, sticky stuff. If it, any sort of rain or anything happens, it just turns into like this layer of stuff that just stacks upon itself. And mm -hmm. you, you soon will like the tar baby and the rabbit. Like it's just awful. Well, when so, it rains, it's not even possible to drive through it. Yeah, they shut the place down. No movement whatsoever. If you're out and about and it rains, you should expect to have to wait to get back to camp until uh, that situation has changed. And it doesn't rain very often, but there have been a couple disaster years in that regard. Mm hmm uh, the last one is getting there. It's also like, uh, Burning Man is a major experience because, um, I go with a crew of art artists. Uh, so we show up early to have the art ready to go by the time the event actually starts. And the drive out is, uh, usually takes, uh, the average has been 28 to 32 hours from like my front door to the campsite. Uh, it did not, that's not including load in and load out. Yeah. So, so we, sp I spent. Monday and Tuesday, slowly packing. Uh, well, I spent like Monday kind of packing on the side. Tuesday, I didn't work, and I spent the whole day getting organized. Wednesday, I spent the entire day or getting organized with two people helping me. And we left at midnight on Wednesday, and we arrived at the burn. Uh, f we basically got to the gate line at Thursday at 1 a.m., but we didn't get – well, no, I guess it was then, Friday at 1 a.m., and we yeah. didn't get to the, our campsite till 7 a.m. on Friday. So it we had been taking turns driving and stuff, but from the, none of us had really slept. So Not more than two hours, maybe. Yeah, if you're coming from anywhere, even reasonably far away, it is a trek. I call the whole thing Mecca. That's yeah. my Mecca. I go back every year. And but if you're taking a, a camp, you can't drive either because you have to haul all your shit out there. Yep. So, And I took some people, uh, some of my friends flew out. They have a place in Reno where they have a storage container full of all of their stuff and their RV oh, is there. that's a good idea. But they bring their generator back, so I drove their generator out. Cool. So you'll have to do some of that arranging and stuff. But getting there and getting back is, uh, in many ways, especially if you're running a camp, which I do, uh, is just a big a deal as the actual burn itself. It's a so. fucking slog. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'd, I was not. That was the part I really wasn't ready for. Like being in the dust, the heat, that was all tough and whatnot, but I loved it. Oh, spending a whole day in a car is, is tough. There were times, too, when I was driving, especially because we drove back, just the two of us, and... Doing like a 20 whatever hour drive with just two people is super difficult because there's just like not enough time to sleep in between each other's. There's a certain point at the end where we were like driving for one hour, sleeping for one hour, driving for one hour, sleeping for one hour. So, yeah, we were well, a gas tank was nearing 300 miles, which is a good three hours of four hours of driving, which is it takes a whole toll to do that. But my first driving shift was. Eight, what did I say? Eight, ten hours or something, but we only mm -hmm. made it basically. Oh, the first time out, yeah. Yeah, I only made it out to Winnemucca, which is technically like with on an inter, like if you went like an off season and you just started in the middle of the desert and you wanted to drive out of the desert and off the playa out to Winnemucca, it's probably about a three hour drive, but it took us eight hours. Well, because traffic and then we had to stop at this place to get gas and just we were just there for just like an hour and a half. Yeah, just it was, gas. Then that, that's something that I knew would happen and I was trying to be prepared for and I did not prepare hard enough. Yeah, I basically, I, so. I should have. Um, uh, galvanize myself against the uh, 
the the Ryan situation because he's like, ah, it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, they thought that they were, he uh, Nate went down to hell right to get some gas, but yeah, but they waited too long. I should have just I should have just been stealing stuff out of the gas cans. Like, oh, it's weird, gas cans are right <laughs> <laughs> so weird. <laughs> oh my. Oh, and the um, other gas canister is gone. Who knows? I do want to say. Um, like, as far as having a camp, kind of like the bigger pr- preparedness aspects of Burning Man, um, way, I had a very successful situation this year, which I uh, would like to share in that we had, I, last year we took um, a deep freeze and we threw a whole bunch of stuff in there and then you freeze it solid. And for the most part, we almost didn't need to run it and it stayed frozen. It was a really good situation. And this year, Ryan's mom came out with her RV and they had like a 2000 watt, something like that. Uh, I want to make solar. something really clear real quick. There was a campmate named Ryan and I am not that Ryan. Yeah, this there is Foo. There are two Ryans. Right at the burn, this was Foo. I was Foo at the burn. There was Ryan and Foo. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, she had like a 2000 watt uh, solar situation and it ran... Everything. The, yeah, it ran the deep freeze. We had lights on like in our kitchen and stuff. We had some minor stuff that kind of broke. But for the most part, that was like, it was a great test bed. Like, I am 100% confident in the ability to go to Burning Man with a solar setup and a couple of good batteries and never have to run a generator. And it's good to have one just in case. Um, but, but yeah, gasoline was, is like, yucky. We were almost off the grid in that regard, which was really cool. And that included a freezer. Yeah. So um, in, a, in a desert. Yeah, in the middle of nowhere. Where it's so. hot as shit. And I do, I do want to, to, to my own credit, uh, I am perfectly comfortable catering for 25 people a thousand miles in the middle of nowhere. Well done. It was impressive. It really was. Yeah, I enjoy the shit out of it. Yeah, I definitely want to help uh, put camp together again yeah. next year. I definitely, uh, well, the first time I went to Burning Man, I definitely was like, I'm going to make stuff that makes this easier. Yeah. I just like, I'm an infrastructure guy, so that's how I roll. Yeah, you did a great job. Uh, what else? I don't know. I mean, we had not an hour because we had that delay restart thing. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we, I do start at two, right? I was, yeah. Yeah, so. You're damn close, though. What what else? Oh, there was, if you've tuned into this, but you did not tune into Ryan's podcast where we talked about stuff, we did talk about the guy who threw himself in the fire. That's a very interesting thing. You should tune into Ryan's podcast. I think it was about halfway through where we talked about that very much in depth and how that was a very interesting situation and how this was kind of a different year for the burn. Yeah. Um, and I'll be interested to see kind of like the after effects of that for next year because it yeah. could very much change things. I have had this feeling that, Two years ago, I went and I was like, "This is going to be like the last burn." And then I went again the year after, and kind of, and I was like, "And the, like cell phones were everywhere." And I was like, "Oh yeah, so, okay. Well, I wasn't wrong about the last burn, but the whole cell phone thing kind of changes the burn so much that maybe I am right about it being mm-hmm. the last burn." And then went back this year, and cell phones didn't work nearly as well. Like they chopped that down a bit, which I was really grateful for because um, I guess this is probably a good finish. It Burning Man's a really magical place. And if you're trying to bump into your friends and you're using cell phones, you're going to miss out on this, like, somehow coincidental magic thing that Burning Man always does. Like, like it will introduce you to the people you need to meet. Yeah. And it might not be the friends that you wanted to. Um, you don't always ask, ask, get what you want, but you'll definitely get what you need. And Burning nowhere is that tr- more true than Burning Man. Yeah. I, I loved the, the radio advertisement that went out, like... We've been hearing a lot of people asking, where can you get reliable Wi-Fi or reliable cell phone signal here at Burning Man? And we've got one very simple answer. Fuck you. <laughs> it was, oh, it was so good. Uh, yeah, fuck you. Yeah. Uh, then that, that's an interesting. There's kind of, um, as part of the culture of the burn, people who go to the burn a lot, burners, you get this kind of... Uh, Agro kind of thing. Trolly. <clears throat> yeah, you put on you put on a kind of a mean face to make sure that people are serious. And the way the, what I equate that to when you're dealing with city government, especially, it's like calling up a really snarky tech support department that is really well equipped to handle your problem, but has no intention of actually handling your problem. Yeah. So um, when you want to escalate your phone call to a manager, they will guilt trip the shit out of you. They will make your life a living hell for just trying to make their life even even and even a little bit more difficult. Mm. They're perfectly happy happy to stare at you and watch you fail and uh it's all part of the experience really so um but as a part of that the kind of like snarky attitude filled aspect of the burn there's a piece of the culture and it's uh, fuck your burn which is kind of it's not really meant as like an inverse you know have a good day but it is almost the use where it is like Shit's going to go wrong, and you should be prepared for that, you know? Yeah. So, like, if you came here with some sort of expectation uh, that is out of line with what the burn is, the burn will probably take that expectation and burn it. Yeah. And part of that is the fuck your burn. It made me think of, like, that Rick and Morty episode where he goes to the, the tiny verse or the, the smaller verse, whatever he calls it, and his, like, greeting that he told them was, blow me. And he goes, no, 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 blow me. <laughs> yeah. 
anyway. Yeah, Burning Man definitely uh, throws a little bit of uh, those normal things to the wind. Which it should. It does a great job of it. Yeah, totally. It's a different place. And that, that is, I'm sitting here doing the, like, how to survive, how to get to Burning Man, how to, like, get through, like, the kind of the things you're going to face day to day and how to normalize those to yourself so that you can then experience the burn, which has nothing to do with what I just totally spoke about. What is actually happening at Burning Man has very little to do with what I just described, which is basically, like, kind of what to expect and the things that you need to, like, be accustomed to and be aware so that those things fade to the back as very normal day-to-day aspects of just like you get up in the morning and brush your teeth, you're going to get up and fill your backpack full of water. And the reason that you did that is because now that you don't have to think about water anymore, you can experience the burn. And the burn yeah. is a very magical place where you can get anything you want, literally anything you want. Um, I mean, I can't th- I can't think of anything that I would, you would not be able to get. You can A like, gun? Uh, you, you can probably find a gun at Burning Man. Damn. Everyone has guns. You know yeah, what I'm saying? So, yeah. um, I, that just random thought, but they do, there, there's a little bit of searching at the gate where they just are looking for people. I have heard stories of dogs, but that's usually like not at the gate. That's like once you've gone in a little bit and the cop sees some reason he thinks he might want to pull you over. Uh, if you're clearly a party crew, you're going to like attract that kind of attention. But of again, don't worry too much about uh, law enforcement. Just run by the normal rules of engagement. Like keep that keep that shit sacred yeah so totally um yeah i guess that that'll probably do it for us so so. uh if you want to go to the if you're a good friend of mine and you're watching this and you want to go to the burn holler at me i do enjoy taking new people because that gives me the ability to see the burn uh in fresh eyes because totally that's easy to forget so uh yeah i will probably reach out to a couple cool people thanks thank you ryan for going i'd love it ryan ryan brought uh, a lot of yin to a lot of other people's yawn which i have not been able to experience at the burn before it was really nice to have a very centered uh personality there to uh share that aspect of the burn with you know so totally well i appreciate you for taking me man it was just an otherworldly experience and as often as i can go again in my life i probably will Sounds good to me. Totally. Should we get out of here? Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, that sounds about feels right because I haven't explained anything as usual. So well, you do a great job. We're going to end the podcast. We might as well end on nothing. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Oh, I did want to say thank you to you. Um, I next year we'll be going back with. I wanted to name the camp, and you you gifted me the name Paladin. So oh yes, Camp Camp Paladin is in effect. Good. I've already started planning. I raised my whole whiteboard, and I'm I've I've made new drawings and upgrades and. Good. Yeah. So. Good. Well, you are quite the paladin, Samson. Thanks. Paladin, Samson. <laughs> All right, y'all. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Love you. This has been nothing explained on the We Are Denver Podcast Network. We are Denver.